What is up? Today's question comes from someone who asked not to share the fullness of their personal story. Um, but I'll give you a summary so you get the context. Uh, they come from a very conservative evangelical family, and they asked, how can I explain, using the Bible, uh, my commitment to Christian universalism? Meaning, there may be a hell, but that junk's empty. You know what I mean? And so, um, <clears throat> here's a few things I would like to suggest, or say, or recommend. One, um, it, it's, it's actually not a crazy liberal idea. I just want you to know that. A lot of times people that have grown up in a context where all the religious variations around them are like, how many are elect? Or how hot is hell? Or um, am I really saved? And there's an anxiety that's intricately bound to your Christian piety about your eternal destination. When those expressions of Christianity are, are, are dominant, the idea that God in Christ is reconciling the world to God's self, and that literally means the world, and uh, it, that there's a revulsion to it because it's actually a threat to the anxiety and questions that nag at the heart of their account of the faith. Now, I think a reason a lot of people get to uh, reading the scriptures and going like, oh, God redeems everyone, is because it actually is, um, I, I, I personally like it the best, but a, a legit way of hearing and reading the, uh, he, the, the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures. And in particular, um, the, the, uh, the early church, the early church, it was like a popular live option. So before we jump into just a few texts that I want to just, you know, recommend a book real quick, this book, Every Knee Should Bow. It is Biblical Rationales for Universal Salvation and Early Christian Thought by Steve Harmon or Stephen Harmon. Um, he was one of my professors in undergrad and, uh, and he is a patristic scholar, like studies theologians in the early church. And uh, he wrote this book and it is on uh, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, and uh, who was in Gregory of Nyssa. So three early church fathers and their um, exegesis wrestling with scripture. And all three of them are types of biblical universalists. And I say all three of them because like Clement of Alexandria is like the guy that articulates what came to be Orthodox Christian Trinity. Right. So when you go, ah, oh, I, I, like I really need to be able to describe um, to my family a understanding of Christian universalism and use the Bible. I like how do I do this? Well, one is just to know like that's how a lot of Christians, ones that shaped everything it means to be a Christian, thought. Now here's the other side of that. Um, underneath that quest to go like how do I describe it and point it out biblically, is probably a shift internally to what is definitional for you as a Christian. A universalist, a Christian universalist, tends to have um, these, these uh, three theological commitments. One, um, that God is love. Now, I know what you're saying, uh, God is love, but this means that there is nothing about God in God or comes from God that is not love. Love is not something God occasionally does or engages in, but God's very essence. Like when you say God is love, that's that the great mystery of God is a mystery in which every depth that is yet to be understood or revealed is another depth of love. God is love, love known and unknown, but nothing but love. At the heart of Christian or biblical universalism is the recognition that the whole narratives that come in and out and are woven into scripture itself, the scripture itself is a narrative of a God who is love. And at the climax of scripture is that passage in 1 John where God, where, where, where John says God is love. So that's one. In the second element is that love requires freedom. And this means that God's actual goal for creation, to bring it to fruition within 
the divine love, requires creation to have genuine freedom. Even Calvinists pretend it's true in their daily lives, all right? For example, when two lovers consummate their marriage in a passionate act of sweet lovemaking, freedom, vulnerability, and risk is what made the actual act inter, uh, of intercourse, making love and not violence. The freedom to give oneself to another and to receive the other as an other is not a human contaminant to love, but essential. And because the God who is loved desires to love all creation, the whole world, and genuine love involves freedom, the creatures of the creator have received a gift of freedom to love God as a result of God's own free decision to love and create. So if God is love, and love requires freedom. It's in though that theological context that things just start to sound different when you read scripture. And I want to point out two of them, uh, and then we can uh, talk about the little third third rule here for biblical universalists. The first one is from First Corinthians chapter fifteen. Uh, this is verses twenty through twenty eight. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first crop of the harvest of those who have died. Since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead came through one too. In the same way that everyone dies in Adam, so also everyone will be given life in Christ. Each event will happen in the right order. Christ, the first crop of the harvest. Then those who belong to Christ that is coming. And then the end, when Christ hands over the kingdom of God to the Father. When he brings every form of rule, every authority and power to an end, it is necessary for him to rule until he puts all enemies under his feet. Death is the last enemy to be brought to an end. Since he has brought everything under control under his feet, when it says that everything has been brought under his control, this clearly means that everything except for the one who placed everything under his control. But when all things have been brought under his control, then the Son himself will also be under the control of the one who gave him control over everything so that God may be all in all. All right. So there you have this picture. What is the power uh, of the resurrection? What does it do? First things. The resurrection of Christ is the first fruits of something all creation comes to participate in. He's the first fruits of a harvest, but the harvest comes after sin, law, death, all these principalities and powers that reign in our world are put under the feet of Christ. And then Christ becomes subject to the Father, gives God's self to the Father. Then, at that moment, God's all in all. So the resurrection of Christ is the first fruits of something everyone participates in. The resurrection of Christ is the revelation of the world's own future in God. It's also in that text describing that the the conquering of sin, the defeat of principalities, powers, whatever it is that keeps us from participating fully in the divine life is being subjected to Christ. So in all things are subjected to Christ when they are put rightly ordered underneath the one God of love. Then all things, it says, come to participate in God. Right? The trajectory of salvation in the text is that God is all in all. So that all that is identifiable is identified with God. You, me, our enemies, people in the past, those yet to be born, all of creation comes to have its place in God. That this other creation, this pl God makes a space for creation and brings things into being and gives them the gift of freedom and relationship. And then the beautiful vision of our future, our end, is when all of those others come to participate freely in the loving essence of the God who is love. When God is all in all, the all includes all. And when all are in God, the God of love, no one, no one is left out. Now, here's the thing. Um, that passage, and uh, plenty of others in Paul, get at this picture. And the reason you get this universalism is that third element, I think, or the third 
theological commitment of a biblical universalist. First, you got the God is love. Second, love requires freedom. And third, is it like love ultimately wins? God's love wins. Why? Because the God who is love is the one and only true God. That there, this infinite creator of all the universe who is love is infinitely committed to loving in living in love with the world. The finite world and every finite person in it will remain for all eternity an object of the pure divine love of God. So both the creator and the creature's freedom can never be compromised for a premature victory. God could never coerce part of creation or any of us into loving God. But this also means that no one can or ever will be forced into loving God. For the very love God desires requires freedom and nothing, including one's death or present state of response, can force the infinite love of God to quit pursuing any and every part of creation. The distance between the infinite love of God and whatever type of resistance and rejection finite reality can give um, is essential for biblical universalism. It's the faithful persistence of God, who is love, that, um, uh, that, that really is the heart, the heart of biblical uh, universalism. So one more passage to look at real quick, and this is in Philippians. And I like this one just because um, when you hear how these early church fathers that were universalists read it, it's like the opposite of how I heard this text. It says, uh, adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider equality with God something to be exploited, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and by becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names, so that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth might bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So here's the thing. Gregory of Nyssa, like OG Trinitarian theologian, he's like, that passage? That's about universalism. Why, you might say? Well, the whole first half is how God's greatest revelation and power in the person of Jesus came what? Through humility, through kenosis, through self-giving. What does love look like in enactment? But love is the one who humbles, who comes, who serves, and is faithful to that love, loving embrace of God all the way to cross. God does not build crosses, but bears them. So that what? At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, most of us have so internalized combative visions of the gospel, battling it out, understandings of mission, evangelism as getting people out of hell and stuff like that. When you hear this text, and I remember, I used to think of it this way until I read the early church fathers, like, that's way cooler. They, you hear this text and you're like, yeah, so if my, my Jewish friend doesn't ask Jesus in his heart, one day he's going to have to call Jesus the Messiah. He's going to bow down, boom shakalaka, and do it. And it's going to be this moment of humiliation or something like, before you died, you should have got right with God. Now look, now look, you're going to have to tell him, say Say it, say it, you're the Christ. Ha! But that's actually not how Gregory read this. What does it say? That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And he goes, what glorifies God? Well, we know if you just listen to Jesus, every time one sinner repents, one coin is found, one sheep is returned. Anytime God has a reason to throw a party, because part of God's creation comes to know itself as known and loved completely by God, God throws a party. What is it like? Where's that biblical reference of coercing someone into calling Jesus the Christ? It doesn't happen. Every person in the Gospels and in Acts 
that confesses Jesus Christ as Lord does so because they're compelled by an encounter, a redemptive encounter, a healing encounter, a transformative encounter, an empowering encounter. If you think of all the individuals who ever come to use the word Christ on Jesus, it's because they were touched and blessed and transformed by God. And so Gregory says, obviously, if everyone comes to give glory to God because of what God is doing in Christ, then they too have been embraced, empowered, encouraged, healed, restored, found a, sol a, 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 a brother in, of solidarity in their suffering, something like that in Christ. So if, the, if here Paul is sharing with us, and this is actually him quoting an early church worship song, um, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Then they're singing about a time in which sin, law, death, oppression, injustice, and all the things that put barriers between human beings and their wor in the world, human beings and each other, human beings and even themselves and human beings and God, when all those powers and principalities are destroyed. They're describing in this song a picture of what it looks like when creation itself finds its future that was testified to in the resurrection of Jesus as the fruits of this first fruit revelation in Christ. It's a picture of what love does when love comes. It's a picture of the God who is love giving the gift of freedom, and in the freedom, all of creation gives glory to God the Father, realizing that God is the canonic one, the self-giving one, the loving one. And as Christians, we call that God. That revelation of God comes in Christ. But this biblical picture, what Gregory of Nyssa is saying is, look, love ultimately wins. Love ultimately wins. And so no matter where you are, and Paul here in Philippians is quoting it from a jail cell, right? He's saying, Jesus was faithful all the way to death on a cross. He didn't coerce. He didn't demonize. He came loving, embracing, and sharing. And it's at that name. It's at that one who imaged the invisible God so beautifully. That is the picture of God that we are going to praise and testify to when all give glory to God, the Father, by saying this is what love looks like. This is our true source and our true purpose and our true future. This life freely lived in the presence of God. So there you go. That's how I would, uh, would look at those texts. And then point out that the early church has always read these texts as with universalism as one option. And then say, I happen to have a few theological commitments I don't think are weird. God is love. Love requires freedom. And if the freedom of the infinite God of love is always going to be loving, then there'll never be a moment where anyone unreconciled and unembraced by the love of God, won't be sought. Peace.